Okay, welcome everyone. This is our third um, webinar on um, issues that are relevant to you know people that are going to be working with um, transition age students who are blind and visually impaired. So I'm very excited. We have Holly Stance with us, um, who will be giving a talk titled "Transitions 2021: Technology to Transportation: The Future Looks Bright." So before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Um, you, you probably heard already that this meeting is being recorded. Um, uh, Holly is open to some participation during her talk. So if you have a question or a comment, you can um, unmute yourself and share. You can also put something in the chat and I'll be monitoring that and then I can share as well, however you're comfortable participating or you could save questions toward the end, totally up to you. Um, and then before you know, I turn it over, I just wanted to provide a little introduction to our speaker. Holly Stance is a University of Pittsburgh alumni, uh, also graduated from the University of Alabama, Birmingham with a Master of Science in Occupational Therapy. She earned her American Occupational Therapy Association Specialty Certification in Low Vision in 2018 and her Academy for Certification of Vision Rehabilitation and Education Professionals Board Certification for Certified Low Vision Therapist in 2019. She currently works as the Low Vision Team Leader at the University of Pittsburgh Centers for Rehab Services Occupational Therapy Low Vision Rehab Program located at the Eye Center. She participates in the planning of the occupational therapy space of the new Vision and Rehabilitation Hospital. Holly is involved in low vision research, including Pixium, Gensight, and Iris Vision, along with grant funding collaboration for low vision. She is involved with PennDOT's study group regarding use of bioptics for adaptive driving. And I think we're all looking forward to hearing more about all of these experiences. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Holly. And I'll bring up your, um, your presentation as well. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy, I hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, one of the things that I really enjoy is giving back. I um, have enjoyed learning about low vision for most of my life. Um, I, I like to uh, give a little bit of background um, just because I think when you identify a passion that you have in life, sometimes um, it's really uh, nothing can come in the way of what you wanna do because of your passion. So um, I was born in Iowa and I grew up near Chicago. I moved to Pennsylvania when I was 16. But when I was living in Chicago, my mother would take us frequently to see her cousin who lived in one of the suburbs. And it was fascinating to me as a young child. I didn't really understand why he was wearing sunglasses in the house. And when I got older and I asked my mom about it, she said, you know, he was a good piano player, wasn't he? I said, oh, I said he was talented. He had such beautiful music and he was just so excited about life and he did everything well. And she said, do you think that he could see okay? And I said, well, I don't know why he couldn't, but I don't really understand why he was wearing sunglasses in the house. She proceeded to tell me that he was blind. He was born blind. And he actually was such a good piano player and such a, a very well um, respected musician that in the Chicago area, anytime um, Liberace, who was a very famous piano player, um, came to town, they would hire a limousine and pick him up and then he would go and, and tune Liberace's piano. So I was, you know, I, I just think that that's such a beautiful story about how, um, you know, we have to think about people and, and, you know, look at the talent that they have and, and help them. Oftentimes we may want to help them identify the talents that they have. Um, the other reason uh, I got really super interested in low vision was um, after moving here and when I got married. Um, so if you're from Pittsburgh, you probably can really appreciate this story. Um, of course, my father-in-law has now passed on, but um, he was a steel worker. Uh, he worked in uh, Christie Park in McKeesport for many, many years, 38 years to be exact. And when I was graduating from uh, OT school in 1991, um, I was taking him, well, actually I wasn't taking him, I was riding in the back seat of the car and we lived in a rural area. If, if you're familiar with Westmoreland County, we lived in a very small town called Ruffsdale. And he was driving on the country roads. We were getting closer to Greensburg and he started asking his wife, you know, what color is the stoplight? You know, is there a car coming? And um, what does the sign say? And I sat in the back seat thinking to myself, oh my goodness, he can't see. <laughs> Um, so then, it, you know, I took him down to Ioneer and they di diagnosed him with macular degeneration. So I started going to every single thing that I could possibly learn about low vision. 
And at that time, um, it wasn't necessarily coming out so much that occupational therapists were helping in low vision, but um, I would like to give uh, some credit to, to uh, she is now Dr. Mary Warren. At the time, um, when I was in 1991, I was a new grad. I actually reached out to her. I went to many of her lectures that she was giving around the country about low vision and, and uh, uh, brain related to, you know, uh, vision loss from TBI and from stroke. And I actually went to many of her courses. And then in 1993, working at a small hospital in Westmoreland County, which unfortunately they tore it down recently, uh, Jeanette Hospital, I, was, I, I still remember standing in the occupational therapy ADL gym and I'm calling Mary Warren. And she said, well, Holly, she said, you know, um, this was 93. She said, you can come down to Kansas and I'll be happy to take you around and you can follow me and you can find out all about low vision. Well, I was a little apprehensive because I thought, you know, I knew that I wanted to grow a program right there in the hospital. And I actually was able to talk to the administrators and say, look, we need to help people that can't see well. We need to do a low vision program in the hospital. But there were a couple of things going on then. Number one, um, I was a new grad and I'm talking to administration, which was kind of really exciting for me at the time. But number two, when I looked on the map, New York City was a lot closer to Pittsburgh than Kansas was. So what happened was I actually reached out to um, New York City. I reached out to um, an organization there, which is very, very famous. I'm sure some of you have heard of Lighthouse. And the people that were running a special program at that time, um, Dr. Eleanor Fay and um, Claire Hood, um, if, you, if you Google Eleanor Fay, she, she is very, very, very respected in the, in the low vision world. Uh, she passed away just a couple years ago. But the, the point being, you know, I started this passion back in 91, 92, 93. And then, you know, I, everywhere I went, I wanted to do something with vision. We were able to start a program at um, Jeanette Hospital, but at that time, you couldn't accept, an occupational therapist could not accept any kind of a referral from an optometrist. So we had to go, uh, because I'm in the medical model, we had to go a different route to get our referrals to help people with low vision. We had to get an ophthalmologist to get a referral, then we could work with the ophthalmologist and the optometrist until 2002 when some of that changed. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the reason I bring all this up is because when I got hired by uh, UPMC CRS in 2013, um, one of the jobs that I, I was vying for was a uh, low vision. And I didn't really get what was happening then at that time. Um, and then in 2013, so in the fall of 2013, I was introduced to Elsa Zavoda. The reason that's important is because she was an occupational therapist who was involved with Centrosite, which is an organization that started um, implanting the uh, uh, miniature telescope. And, and we're gonna talk about that too. And so she came to Pittsburgh and she was teaching the OTs in the clinic at that moment to learn about this particular um, application of science. And she said to me, well, why don't you go to UAB? You know, they have this great program with Mary Warren. And I literally about fell off my chair because I had kind of fell out of the, the realm of the low vision. I've always did a lot of things with vision. I, I, I wrote grants for the DynaVision to help people you know, everywhere I worked, but I kind of lost touch with Mary Warren. And here, that's when I went back to school, got my degree from UAB. And she was actually the director of the low vision um, rehab uh, graduate certificate program. So I am very blessed. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great story. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful opportunity. And to share some of these things, um, I, I you know, I'm very happy to be here with all of you. I'm not sure where you are in your education. And I did ask um, Jamie in the beginning, you know, can this be interactive? Because it's important to me to know who I'm speaking with. Um, if you're interested, we could take one minute and you can go around the room and just tell me a little bit about, you know, you know, where you're at in the school process. You know, are you a counselor? Are you a TVI? You know, what is your interest in this? Just because it helps um, for me to kind of like, wow, okay, I can kind of talk a little bit more about that or whatever, because um, honestly, you don't really have to twist my arm to talk about this topic. I love it. It's, it's very dear to me. Uh, I actually still have uh, a very, a sister who's not too much older than myself that's suffering some, some vision loss. And I, you know, it's something that I'll always, always have a passion for. So if we just take one second, I already met um, Tessa, which is great. Um, Donna, if you want to just uh, unmute for just a second and let me know about yourself. If, we, if you don't feel comfortable that we don't have to do this, we'll just keep on going. It's not a problem. Um, I'm a student at Pitt, and I had an appointment at this time, so I'm actually listening while I'm at the appointment with a okay. mask on, so I don't want to um, talk too long. That's okay, okay. That's okay. Thank you. Joanna? 
Hi. Uh, I'm just laughing at Donna. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Joanna, and I have been a teacher for over 25 years, um, elementary, and currently I'm teaching middle school, uh, eighth grade reading. Uh, so this is kind of my second career, as you can say. Um, one thing about me is that I have a son, he's in 11th grade, and he has low vision. Okay. He has albinism. Mm hmm um, so I've kind of been his, um, you know, unofficial TVI <laughs> mm -hmm. since he was born. Um, and he currently is like a straight A student, mm -hmm. honor student, plays two instruments, drives a car on a restricted license. Okay. Just state swimmer just does everything you know but he does have the the low vision and you have to keep that in mind um so yeah i just kind of love this stuff on a personal level but also uh on a tvi level as well for my future well thank you very much for sure. sharing um i don't have anybody else on my screen i'm sure there's other people i think i saw shireen yeah. and and i know shireen <laughs> Yeah. Hi, Holly. Hi. It's so good to see you. Um, uh, just so everyone knows, I am a first year counseling student now, and I actually had the pleasant opportunity to work with Holly in my previous role as a clinical research coordinator at the UPMC Eye Center. And they are doing some incredible work. So it's very, I'm very excited to be here and hear you talk. Aww. Thank you. It's so nice to see you, Shireen. You are in the right place because you have a great heart. Yeah, it's so good to see you too. Thank you. Um, how about Alexis? Hi, I'm Alexis, and I'm also a first year uh, mental health counseling student at Pitt. Nice to meet you. Uh, Rebecca, you want to say hi? Yeah, sorry, can you see me? Mm -hmm. Okay, hi, I'm Rebecca McElhenney and I'm also a first year um, counseling student at uh, in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Nice to meet you. Um, Julia? Maybe we'll come back to Julia. Oh, there she is. She went away again. Okay, we'll come back to Julia. Um, Jason? Hi, uh, I'm Jason. I'm also a first year counseling student as well. Just starting to learn about this stuff. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Meg? Hi, I'm Meg. I'm a current TVI at the Western Pennsylvania School for Blind Children and I'm in the comms program right now and I'm really interested in the subject. And there's contractors about to start up with a drill behind my house again. So I'm going to put on mute again real fast before they start up again. <laughs> it's nice to meet you, Meg. Um, Madalena. Hi. Yeah, I know my, no my name is crazy, but uh, I'm a first year at the TVI program at Pitt for master's and certification. But both my parents were both TVIs. So that's kind of how I was introduced to this world and always fought it. I was like, I'm never going to be a teacher. Hmm. Oh my gosh, why would I do what my parents do? <laughs> and here I am, you know, how it goes. But yeah, I just love this, this type of stuff. And yeah, I'm just excited to be here. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Autumn. Hi, I'm Autumn. I'm a third year uh, TVI in Pennsylvania out in South Central PA. I am also part of the Combs program and I graduated with my master's in December and have my internship scheduled for this summer. Congratulations. Thank you. It's nice meeting you. You as well. Lindsay. Hi, I'm Lindsay. Um, I am a third year TBI as well. I graduated from Kutztown and I'm in the Combs project. Um, and I currently live in King of Prussia, but I subcontract in Delaware. 
Um, just a side note, I'm very interested in this. My friend is um, an OT, but she specializes in mental health and like, I guess you would like sexual relations or human sexuality, um, however you want to state it. But um, I just think it's super cool, the crossover between OT and, and vision. Oh, thank you. No, you're nice to meet you, Lindsay. You too. Try Julia one more time. No. Um, okay, I think I got everyone's. Is there anybody that I missed? It's hard one. I have a tiny little, tiny little screen here of people. I think that was everyone though. Well, thank you all for sharing and um, I, I will get started. Um, one thing I did want to mention, um, I did graduate from uh, back in the time it was called the School of Health Related Professions at Pitt. I'm very, very active with um, the Pitt program right now, um, doing a lot of different things. I, I'm a guest lecturer for Pitt, uh, the occupational therapy department when we talk about uh, low vision. I'm also um, invited uh, once a year to do um, some guest lecturing and a collaboration with um, Dr. Mark Redfriend, who's in the, in the uh, Department of Engineering. So that's really cool because we, we look at um, the Human Factors Lab and some really cool stuff about how vision works. And uh, we'll, get, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I think the most important thing I'd like to share with everybody is that my focus has always been on the patient experience and trying to help them um, experience the best that they can and achieve the best capacity for themselves, because as you mostly probably know that occupational therapy is really important to, with regard to that. Excuse me, I'm going to cough. I apologize. <coughs> um, I think I'm going to get a glass of water. I'll be right back. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, April just happens to be a National Occupational Therapy Awareness Month. So we're celebrating, but I think uh, it's just really important to, to look at how um, as an occupational therapist working with people that have low vision, it, it, it matches everything that we do. Um, your activities of daily living, um, um, the, um, the ability to do from cooking to cleaning, to being able to manage your money, to being able to go out in the community, it's all very, very important. We can um, hit the next slide. Thank you. So tonight, we're going to take a little bit of time and just talk about some of these things. Um, uh, technology is really, really important. Um, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to, to ask and, and have everybody introduce himself. Because, <coughs> excuse me, I, I, the beautiful flowers are out right now, but they're not agreeing with my lungs. So I apologize for that. Um, Anyway, we, we think about how times have changed. And if I had to draw out of a hat, anyone in my family or myself to have any kind of an impairment, um, I would never have thought this a couple years ago, but the times have changed so much in our town. Uh, and I don't know, I will we'll talk about a lot of this. Um, I'm not sure how much everyone's aware of what's happening in Pittsburgh with regard to the vision hospital, the vision restoration uh, facility that is being built. Um, but going back to OT and how we want to look at um, the experience of the patient, you know, we're very, very interested in evidence-based practice and promoting and improving ADLs and quality of life measures. So we work very closely with a lot of organizations. I work closely with, uh, for example, Pennsylvania Occupational Therapy Association, too, because we're looking at best practices, best policies for low vision and driving. Um, my background, I didn't mention this, I've worked most of my career with the elderly population across inpatient rehab, long-term care, outpatient facilities, and also continuous care retirement communities. I do have uh, experience with the younger population um, from like 14 to 20. Not, not quite nearly as much as everyone in the room is going to have, but I do want to share that um, my purpose here is to, to, to promote each and every one of you to, to help. And I'm sure, you know, maybe you're not thinking of this at the moment, but every single person that's on this call tonight is gonna to be able to make a huge difference in someone's life who has a low vision. Um, and for, for the, I'm sorry, I don't recall your name, but the, the young woman who is a, um, sharing the fact that her son has low vision, you're going to be a champion as well. And so the, the part of me that really wants to encourage folks to, about learning about anything is the fact that you have 
within your capacity, you know, you can take new knowledge on and you can say, okay, I had to learn it for the lecture. I had to learn it because this was a series we had to go to. But if you take learning as an opportunity to say, look, you know what, this is great because I can see in the future, I can kind of see how this can actually help someone bridge that gap between being over here kind of in a situation where they might feel stuck as opposed to being on the other side where they have gotten some very good direction and they're being able to uh, achieve things that perhaps they never thought they could ever do. And so that's why this is so important to me. I always go back to that moment when my mother told me that my that her cousin was blind. And I just thought, my goodness, at that time, I mean, we're talking, I'm a few days older than most of you in the room, but that we're talking about, he would have had to have grown up in the forties and the fifties. He would have had to have grown up even bef- you know, between the thirties and the forties. Cause I think he was 10 years older than my mom. So those were times when visual impairment and having you know, challenges like that were not necessarily accepted in our society as they are today. So it's really, really great to be here. We're talking about innovation. We're talking about looking at how we learn about things that are coming up and how we can share that information with across stakeholders, uh, uh, collaborating with, uh, you know, physicians and, and the therapists and uh, the community and, and also with, uh, you know, healthcare plans and uh, schools and, you know, just a lot of different things that we can think about. So when we talk about technology today, just I, I'm hoping that when this is all done, you'll have two new technologies that you might not have been aware of. We're going to identify some assistive technology resources, and I'm sure you probably have a lot more. Um, and then we're going to talk about how this transportation um, bill came about, how, how this all transpired. And we're gonna help you understand the, uh, the steps that you might have to help a student understand about bioptic driving. So it's gonna be kind of a fun time. So we can go ahead into the next slide. So I, I took this from a, um, one of the PowerPoints that I've done for people that are not as young as the ones that you're going to be working with. But I think what it does for me is it speaks about how Right now in the United States of America, we are so blessed and, and able to engage in the technology that was not so easy to get. We still have to remember that there are people that may not have access to some of the high speed internet. They may not have access to some of this technology, but I'm gonna help you kind of figure out that that doesn't necessarily have to be forever if you have the right um, pathways. So I, I thought this was very <laughs> apropos when I was talking to a group of seniors because they do feel Feel left out, you know, and, and I know the younger folks will not feel left out, but this is just something that we can always remember. Hey, you don't have to be left out. There's so much available now. Next slide. So these are just some things that I want to bring to everybody's attention. <clears throat> In the United States of America, one out of four people will have some type of disability. Twice as many adults ages 18 to 64 with a disability will live in poverty, okay? And then two of three um, unemployed adults with disabilities want a job. So it, it's just that we wanna remember that your role in, in whether you're counseling or whether you're TVI, you know, the things that you can do to help that person, to engage them, to recognize their capacity, you might be surprised that they come back to you several years later and say, you know what, you you brought me to some place that I didn't know I could ever go. And I, I think about that with my own life. I think about how back in 1974, um, I was visiting, I was a um, uh, Explorer Scout, and we visited the, the Heinz uh, VA hospital in the city of Chicago, and it was right during the Vietnam War. And we went to the occupational therapy department, and they told me what the great things that OTs did about how they helped holistically bring people back from the terrific, the horrific uh, war and, and the things that were happening. And I, I just thought to myself, wow, you know, if I could be part of that someday, if I could really help, you know, other people do things with, with their craft and, and with uh, learning about themselves through occupation, you know, that would just make my life, you know, a tremendous value to me and to other people. And so again, you know, that was one of those things that I just happened to belong to. I belong to an explorer, spouting, uh, explorer scouting post and we took a trip. So those kind of serendipitous things can happen for each of us on this call. You, you come across something that you may not be aware of and wow, now it turns into this great lotus flower that opens and shares of joy for everyone. Next. So, and, and we talk about, I, I know this is a buzzword and um, I took this, um, I wrote this down when I was driving, well, I didn't want to, when I was driving, when I got parked and I, I listened to it again, I played it and played it in the office and I wrote it down. Um, it, it was a beautiful uh, 
podcast that was offered. And again, all these things are referenced. Um, this was a podcast and this was um, Audrey Bush. She's an ATP uh, at the Easter Seals Crossroad. Uh, she had, well, she, actually she was speaking at Easter C Seals Crossroads. And I encourage you with regard to learning. If you like podcasts, that is one of the best ones about assistive technology that you might ever come across. So she was talking about AT3, which, you know, I, I, I know, uh, um, with OT and, and low vision and learning about technology, there's a lot of avenues that I'm not 100% familiar with, but I'm starting to go on those roads because we're getting driven to different things. And she was talking about how people don't necessarily think about um, when you're talking about vision impairment, you know, what does inclusion mean? You know, we, we were hearing about all these other things in life, but it, you know, this was just a beautiful thing that she said. And I, I thought, well, I'm going to write that down because it's true. You, you just really want everybody to feel that they can be the same or, or, or have the opportunity that everyone else has. So this is huge to me. And I, I think being treated as you want to be treated yourself, that goes, you know, a hundred percent. And it's not even just about vision. It's about, you know, even in the aging population, sometimes people get left behind because they're not accepted or they're not thought of as being valuable. Um, next. So we, for those of you who are familiar with rehab, I'm sure you all know about occupational therapy. And um, I love how, the, you know, the recent 10, 15, 20 years, they've actually kind of looked at it as a real science of living. And for me, when we talk about low vision and we talk about where I'm at, so I'm in a clinic, um, it's in the medical model. And so we have ophthalmology, we have optometrists, we have genetic counseling, as Shireen indicated, we also have research. So what's beautiful about it is that we have this capacity to share and, and, and discuss things, but also to recognize that the patient is at the core center and that we, we look at them holistically and we have to be part of a team because not one person can really take care of all of it. We, we need to actually, I've talked to Shireen a couple of times about this, how very, very important it would be to have <clears throat> counselors at our, our facility because I work with people from, you know, age 14, 15, all the way up to not, the oldest person I saw in the clinic was 99. And when you talk about vision impairment and low vision, so if you're working in a school system, you, the person, the child most likely had it all their life. In our situation at the clinic, sometimes, you know, people have gone through life without any low vision and all of a sudden they have something traumatic happen. This has happened four times over the last five months. I've had people that have something called giant cell arteritis and it's a terrific, it, it, it's really a sad and, and, and fast moving situation. Um, and, and I asked the doctor about it one time. I said, well, why don't they... <laughs> Why don't they put a public service message out there like they do for heart attack and stroke? So if you know anyone who's starting to lose their vision and, and it seems like it's something is strange, get them to the ER and tell them to check out GCA because if they can stop it, they might only lose vision in one eye. And if they don't stop it, they lose vision in both eyes. And it, it, it I mean, that's the end. You lose vision 100%, you lose it. And it, it can happen over 24 hours. So I, I think for us, we look at this team approach and we say, okay, we have everybody talking to try to help the patient. And I know it can be better, but this is, a, you know, it's a good way to think about how we can react and, and interact with other people. Next. So of course, uh, if you know about occupational therapy, these are everything, you know, um, that we, we work with every single avenue of a person's being from making decisions for self-management of their health care to finances, to um, personal relationships, to um, being able to cope and, and identify what did you do in the past when you had a tragedy? What did you do in the past when perhaps someone passed away? And we also talk about grief, you know, because actually when you think about um, low vision and you think about any kind of a chronic illness or chronic disease process, you know, there is a, a for some people, they may not identify it this way, but we can certainly match up the grieving process, you know, the anger, the frustration, um, you know, the coping mechanisms, and the, the finally the acceptance, you know, the same thing that Kubler-Ross wrote about many, many years ago. We can line that up with this whole process of low vision if it happens, you know, traumatic, traumatically or if it happens over time. So we, again, we are very focused on all of these areas. And um, so we have a great opportunity because we can kind of help people identify what's, what's, uh, what's gonna help them uh, move forward. Next. Oh, had to put a little golf in there anyway. So how we help, 
Um, these are some areas that we uh, look at with low vision. Uh, we teach people how to do activities, obviously, with less vision. We're using adaptive equipment strategies, compensatory techniques, um, self-management skills, how to compensate for their low vision. Uh, as we all know, low vision is vision that is not able to be uh, corrected by any type of means, whether it's surgery, whether it's medication, or um, whether it's glasses. So, you know, we, we tell people when they come into the clinic, you know, we're going to, we're going to look at these things. We're going to uh, have, we have a sort of an outline from Dr. Smith or another physician who sent us a referral, but we really want you to tell us what's most important for you. You know, it's very, very patient driven. You know, clearly if they're coming in and they don't meet the criteria for driving and they tell me they want to drive, then we have this discussion. Well, you know, in the state of Pennsylvania, there's certain requirements you have to meet and we, we're not meeting those right now. So that's not going to be an option for you, but we can talk about driving retirement and we can talk about what other methods you can get uh, in the account, you know, the area to help you get from point A to point B so that they continue to have some type of um, hope, but also they have uh, the capacity to plan and to be uh, engaged and also be responsible for their transportation. So um, I, I think the one thing that we've really um, looked at recently is how how are we going to help um, keep the training up so that the patient or the you know the participant doesn't um, lose sight of their device or you know how do we keep them engaged and and that's a huge thing right now um, in the research that's going on in our area uh, we're looking at patient reported outcomes and you know patient engagement uh, with the process of research because if we design or we work with things and we don't really include them, then it's not really gonna be for them. It's gonna be for uh, what a scientist thinks is it should happen, but we're not really moving forward with that. Um, so on the right-hand side, you see a magnifier, and then you see the TV, uh, Max TV glasses that um, we work with some of those. And again, these are things that uh, Dr. Smith has referred to us and we're helping them uh, by doing all of the um, uh, compensatory strategies, eccentric viewing, uh, training, uh, any type of uh, strategy that needs to be done so that they can be uh, successful with the devices. Next. And so again, um, I talked a little bit about how ours is obviously the medical model and I know that you're all involved in the, in the um, educational model. So it's a little bit different um, because we do, uh, you know, uh, build the insurance company and we, you know, have um, different things that we have to pay attention to. And this was just an overview of where, you know, you might see a low vision provider. And in the city of Pittsburgh, you know, there's a couple different things. We have BVRS, we have BBVS, we have our department. We also have the VA. So there's like four different um, locations where you can get low vision uh, assistance. And when a person gets referred to me by doc, like for example, Dr. Smith will refer, make a referral to me. Um, one of the first things I do is I always ask them if they are a veteran because that's very, very important to me. My grandfather and my uncle were both veterans. And I really think it's important to, to always be um, you know, uh, open and upfront about what services are available so that they can make the best choice if they choose to stay with us and we'll be happy to help them. Um, and next. So again, uh, as you all know, especially um, when we're talking about vision, you know, it's not just about reading, it's not just about mobility. Uh, vision is probably one of the most complicated systems um, I, next to the, you know, the, the brain, of course, um, in, in the body. And, you know, it, it, it's very uh, comprehensive and sometimes there's a lot of moving parts. And what I'm sure each and every one of you have experienced, if you had it in your family or if you've seen other people, um, I can give you an example of a, of a situation um, that is kind of a, what we call a head fake or a disconnect. So, you know, um, a lot of times people misunderstand vision. Um, you know, there might be somebody that is um, using a cell phone, but they're also using the long cane for mobility. And people just, you know, may not understand that. They get on the, the bus and they can look at their cell phone, but they have to use a white, you know, the, the mobility cane for um, orientation mobility. And, you know, people just don't get that. And I, I think what's very, very important is, especially in our department, when they come in, I always say, you know, um, I don't take anything for granted. We're doing an assessment and your vision can maybe change depending on your disease process, but I know that no two people are the same. And um, we do have, uh, which is really cool in our department, we do have the, um, uh, the goggles that we can actually have uh, some patients, family members try on, at least especially before COVID anyway, so that they can simulate what it's like to have a vision impairment so that they can have a little bit more understanding of what their uh, family member is going through. Next. 
So our evaluation, again, looks at functional vision and we look at a lot of different things. We look at ocular motor function, visual field, visual attention, you know, being able to read, you know, what does critical uh, print size mean, writing, contrast sensitivity, depth perception, um, fall prevention. We are, when I uh, continued my education at the UAB, we do have, they do educate you in, um, for all the O&Ms on the call, we do um, teach and help people understand a little bit of the sighted guide. Because as you well know, um, as, as I know, you know, there, there are not a lot of people like us that are out there. And so what happens is there's a disconnect between the time a person gets to our clinic and time they might be able to have O&M services. So we at least want to help the family know what's safe with functional mobility as far as sighted guide goes. Um, we definitely all the time are talking about orientation mobility. I think it's hugely very important. And unfortunately, there's not, you know, we, we need more of you. So congratulations to all of you on the call that are doing O&M. Um, I think it's important because what's happening is, you know, there's a lot of older people and they, they don't necessarily understand that you don't have to be totally blind to have it. I think it's hugely important to keep people in, uh, independent in the community. So as much as possible, I'm always referring to, the, to your services because it's huge. Um, so some of the things on the bottom of the list, so the PHQ-9, I don't know if you're familiar with the, um, the, uh, the questionnaire for depression, but as most of us know, or if you haven't known before, you're going to know after the conversation tonight, a lot of people that have uh, vision impairment are depressed. Uh, maybe not if you're born with a vision impairment and you grow up with it, but uh, the people that I see, a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the folks do have depression. And so we talk about coping mechanisms and strategies so that they can help um, better understand what they can do for themselves. And then the last one, the revised self-assessment, um, that is an, uh, a document that Mary Warren and her group actually helped to establish. It's a, a questionnaire that we ask uh, the patients at the beginning and uh, the, the first session and the last session. And it gives us a lot of great input about their capacity to do um, all kinds of things with regard to vision. We are also using the uh, low vision quality of life assessment because we think that's really important. Next. And these are just a couple of, um, so a, a lot of times uh, early in from 2014 to 2019, till we couldn't go anymore. Um, I went to a lot of the Envision conferences and I'm not sure if you're not familiar with it, I'll be glad to take one moment and tell you about it. So Envision is an organization out in Kansas and I actually got to visit the, the home place. It's absolutely beautiful. And what they do is initially they had a, a, a big um, program every year, one like a, I think it was like a four day session that was usually held either in Minnesota or it was held in Colorado. And then finally the one I got to go to and present at was in Kansas. And they have all kind. Of, they had that time. They had all kind of vendors for low vision products. And so I actually got to meet um, um, Pete that developed that on the left. I'm sorry, I forgot his last name, but he was a great. He's still living. He's a great scientist. And so he decided to make a device that would help us to establish what kind of lighting would be helpful to a patient. And you can actually um, mimic um, color contrast on this as well. So on the left side of the, of the device, it gives you the Lux and on the right, it gives you the Kelvin. So when you put that calculation into a formula, they give you a big chart. You can actually determine what type of lighting you might need for someone like a 800 lumen bulb. And then I tell folks that they can go to a Walmart or wherever, you know, I give them um, a sampling or the family members a sampling of what the, the box of the, the uh, light bulb will look like. It's, it reminds me very much of a um, food box now, you know, it has all these information on it. It's like nutritional information, but it's very helpful to them because then they can kind of adjust the lighting that they can use at home and um, lighting. And, you know, that's a very simple fix. I mean, for in the home, of course, lighting and adapting to lighting is not so easy, but changing the lighting in the home is cheap. At least it's gotten a lot cheaper anyway. And it's very quick to do. It's not something that you have to get rewired. You just get a different bulb and you place the light in the appropriate place. So on the right, is just a picture of how we would do that. Next. And then technology, of course, you know, this was a, this was right out of the Britannica um, a dictionary. So it's interesting, you know, we think about technology and we think about assistive technology and what, what does that really mean to us? You know, it's uh, anyway, you can see it uh, it's, uh, looking at um, the practical aims of life and making it better and manipulating the environment. Next. So this was really cool to me when I um, did a discussion for uh, a group of folks that were, you know, uh, older and they really wanted to learn about how things have changed. Well, if you think about it a million years ago, technology was fire. In 1974, we got the PC and the internet, right? 
2017, we got artificial intelligence. OCR, optical character recognition, which is huge. It's very, very important. Robots, Alexa, Google Assist. You know, we're not sure where <clears throat> technology is going, but some of us might think soon there'll be dri self-driving cars. Some of us might think that, uh, you know, who knows? I, I know in, in, at the Eye Center, we're doing some really cool things where um, Dr. Sahel, who was um, brought over from France in 2016, he was recruited to Pitt and to the Eye Center as a, a tremendously uh, well-known, world-renowned scientist, uh, ophthalmologist. And one of the things he participates in is um, this future of <laughs> vision, uh, vision restoration. And it's biological. It's from, um, you know, uh, doing genetics to, um, you know, implantation of uh, bio uh, chips. Uh, to, you know, doing injections, uh, you know, uh, viral injections uh, to, to promote uh, replication of the cells in, in, you know, in the retina. So it's really, really huge. So we really don't know at this moment, you know, um, some people think that, oh, you know, you, can, you, can you provide artificial vision? You know, well, we're working, they're working on that. We have uh, a couple of people we're the second um, site in the world to do one of the, the studies called the Apixium, where they've actually implanted a very, very small chip into the retina. And what happens then is um, with uh, infrared lighting, a uh, person wears a pair of goggles and the light beam hits onto the chip and then they're supposed to, you know, they're able to look at something and um, they're, in, they're taking people that were considered, um, you know, severe, severe, severely low vision and they're giving them, uh, you know, a higher uh, ability to see. So it's almost taking someone who's blind and being able to see a little bit now. So it's, it's huge and we were just in the beginning. So next. So AT, as most of you know, is a device, uh, any type of thing that you can use to help someone, um, whether it's education, employment, daily living. Um, what's interesting, again, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the AT3 Act. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the AT Act uh, that started in 1986, then it went to 2004. Um, so it, it's throughout the United States. Um, it, it's huge. Uh, it allows for opportunities for uh, use of technology. Um, the other thing is when we, we think of AT, if you're familiar with the, the Pennsylvania PATF, uh, Pennsylvania Assistive Technology Foundation, there's actually um, some really cool things that that organization are doing right now. And um, if you want more information, it is in the PowerPoint. You can actually recommend for someone right now, it started in January, if they need a loan for equipment, it can go from, I believe, $150 to $7,000. So you can get a loan at no cost, so it's no interest for four years, and that will help a person be able to access uh, assistive technology. Now, when we talk about assistive technology, even though the definition is up there, let me share a story with you that I got from one of the people from PATF. So they said that, you know, assistive technology doesn't necessarily have to be like um, what we think it might be. So for example, maybe you think it's a computer, okay? Well, maybe. She, um, she explained to me that there was a family that approached them because they have a child that had autism and they were concerned that the child um, was not necessarily able to stay contained in the backyard because of whatever their behavior was. So they asked if it was possible to have some funding to be able to put a fence up. And so they were actually able to get that loan because the child needed it to help them maintain some quality of life and independence and safety. So when we think of a little bit outside of the box, assistive technology doesn't necessarily have to be like the $4,000 CCTV or the computer or JAWS or what have you. It can be a lot of different things. And it's really helpful to know that because when you look at your state system, then you can probably, you know, um, maybe use your uh, ability to you know collaborate and encourage people to be able to get that help that they need without really thinking okay well it's just it's not a computer and we can't go there so it's it's anyway it's a good way to think so next so again this uh, every state has these um, opportunities so the four state the four state level activities would be assistive technology demonstration um, device loan reutilization and state financing <clears throat> and every state has um, this underneath 
uh, you know, in in their uh, government. So you you have to look under, um, you know, whatever the state you live in, look for the assistive technology programs, and they are mandated by law to have these, uh, you know, actual uh, device programs for people. Um, the interesting thing about the PATF is you could actually borrow equipment for like, it's almost like a loaning library. You could borrow it for a month. You have to turn it back in. And then they also have a program where if someone passes away or perhaps they've outgrown that assistive technology, which, you know, in the school system, you can imagine that, then they can actually revitalize it and use it again. Um, the state financing was an example of the PATF program that I just spoke about. Next. Again, here's um, you know the the mini loan program, no fee. Okay, hundred dollars to seven thousand. So, and the AT3 center, it's it's huge. Um, you know, it's uh, housed under, um, you know, it used to be called something else, um, human something. I'm sorry, I lost it years ago. It was called something else, but the program is housed under the assistive technology and the uh, administration for community living. So, you know, it's a huge pushing the government to try to keep people where they're at. So I think it's going to be even more valuable as um, the students grow up and they, you know, engage in this opportunity to have the assistive technology and actually be able to be more educated about the technology that can help them so that they can have more um, personal investment and capacity to say, look, you know, I know that if I have this or if I'm aware of that, I might be able to, to uh, be able to do things more for myself. Next. And again, as we know about vision, we know that uh, vision impairment, you know, affects all of these things. Uh, obviously, the dependent, uh, the, you know, how quick a person's able to make a decision can be very related and dependent upon vision. Um, you know, how your environment, uh, your ability to react to the environment is huge. <coughs> Excuse me. And I realized, again, you know, when, when we talk about children, that are growing up in the system and they are familiar with, you know, having orientation mobility early on. And they, they, they really, um, in my opinion, they, they have a great um, capacity to engage because they, they learn quickly and, and they learn how important it is to be self sufficient, so to speak. And they're fine. Their, their confidence is probably a lot higher than some of the people that I see because they, they've grown up with it and the ability to have all that opportunity. Next. So when when we talk about the technology, you know, this is this was very interesting to me. Um, doing a little bit of review for the talk, um, the global trend, you know, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. Um, they're expecting that assistive technology growth is going to be seventy three percent by twenty twenty four. Uh, and the World Health uh, Organization, uh, the World Health Organization, excuse me, is actually looking at how this is going to help people throughout the world. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite uh, fascinating. You know, maybe, you know, we might think of a, a country that doesn't have maybe great access to health for everybody, but maybe, you know, I, I've heard many, many times that, um, so even if, they're economically challenged, they might have a cell phone and which is fine because if they have the ability to have a cell tower and they have a cell phone that gives them some type of connection. So it, it's just really uh, fascinating. Again, it, it's, it's great. We, we live in a wonderful time where we can actually help a lot of people. Next. So uh, this was just a, you know, uh, looking, uh, you know, right now at this very moment in 2019, who, how many people really in America have a cell phone, right? So clearly we know that people that are younger are going to have a lot more, um, you know, need for that and access to that. Um, you know, the older folks, people over 90, you know, it, it really should never, you should never categorize or put people in boxes, but I will tell you, and I, and I don't, um, one time someone talked to me about their age and I said, well, this is the way I look at it. It gives you certain privileges, it gives you certain discounts, and it's just a measurement. It doesn't really say anything about who you are or what you're doing in your life. I had a 98 year old woman that came into the low vision clinic and told me everything she does with Alexa. And I was very impressed. And I said, well, I'm gonna have to write some of those things down. So it doesn't matter how old you are. You can, you, you know, technology knows no age. Assistive technology knows no age. And it's just a good way to think about it. Next. 
in our department, we have um, a couple of different things. We have electronic and, magnific and computer magnification. So on the left, we have something called the, the far left is the um, Optelec Traveler. Uh, the one in the middle is the uh, Visalux made by Eschenbach. And um, the, the middle one, you can actually um, connect to a television and you can actually use it at a TV or a computer screen and you can actually have everything much larger. And then of course, all the way to the right, we have Zoom text. I heard a, um, an interesting story, uh, speaking of Zoom text, I heard an interesting story about um, um, uh, Microsoft. In, uh, apparently they have acquired um, Dragon Dictation. So there's a possibility that maybe with that connection, um, they might be doing a little bit more with their computers to help people, which I think would be absolutely fantastic. I think universal design and capacity for everyone inclusion would be very helpful, especially as uh, the baby boom generation moves forward. So what I think this might translate into is whenever a person buys a computer, so that some of that stuff might be built in, as we know, uh, for example, Windows 10 has a lot of more accessibility than any other uh, program in the recent past. So the computers are really trying to, I think, catch up and also um, maybe outshine other computer program products so that they can be um, more competitive and, 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 you know, obviously make some more money. Next. Again, this is just a uh, something you can look at if, you, if you're not familiar with it. Windows 10 uh, does have a, a great program for um, ease of access. And it's not just about vision, it's about hearing as well. Next. And of course, iOS, um, for those of you on the call, if you have a, an Apple product, uh, going back to UAB, when I graduated there with my graduate certificate in low vision, we were um, invited to come every two years for a clinical update. Of course, uh, we didn't get too many of those because of COVID, but um, one of the discussions we had, there was a gentleman that got in front of a group of us, there was 50 of us at the time, and he announced that he was a lawyer and he said, you know, I'm here to talk about um, technology and I would just want you to know that I'm not being paid by this for any, I mean, I'm not being um, endorsed by anyone or suggested that I should come, but I am totally blind and the only product that I can use is an Apple product. It's the only one I can use because it's the easiest one for me to access. Uh, in 2007, Apple actually um, built a group of people um, to improve accessibility. So it was uh, kind of like a universal de design. And I, I can't recall the amount of people of, you know, from different um, disability areas that are on this team. I know there was someone with low vision, there's someone with low hearing, there's someone who's physically uh, has challenges that is not able to, you know, manipulate the, the device like everyone else. So. You know, I, I realize that it's a marketing uh, area, but I also um, applaud that because I think, again, um, over the years, it's it's um, it's very apparent to me that while some um, challenges uh, still occur for people that are physically um, not able to do certain things, I think the low vision and, and hearing areas have been um, uh, underserved, and I'm hoping that that's changing uh, every day as we speak. Next. So again, I, I'm not sure how much of, uh, how many of you are familiar with these things. Um, you know, if you're interested and in, in really like to learn about technology and want to list, uh, I have a couple of uh, resource lists that I have compiled that I'll be happy to email you in, you know, in the future. Um, these are just some of the things that I just put on the, the discussion. Um, Be My Eyes. Um, so if you're familiar with that, that's a tremendous app. What um, mirrors that in the paying world is something called IRA, it's A-I-R-A. -A. Uh, the only difference between the two things are that the people that volunteer for the Be My Eyes app are just that, they're volunteers, they're not being paid, and they don't necessarily, I'm sure they're vetted in some fashion, but um, probably not as much as the, the, the people that are being paid in the IRA app. So basically what happens um, with this app is you, you uh, engage in it and perhaps you're somewhere and you need to find out what's in front of you. You need to find out, you know, if there's a product on the, uh, you know, in the grocery store and you want to know what it is, you um, tap the app and you hold the phone up and someone somewhere else in the United States will answer and they'll tell you what it is. And the same thing with the IRA, only IRA, they actually can give you a pair of glasses and a little camera on it. You're using, you're utilizing the app and then, you know, the camera on the glasses kind of helps the person recognize where they're at. And of course we have the news line, we have talking books, which you have to pay for. We have the Kindle app. Um, the BARD is huge. I think it's absolutely a tremendous um, application for people. 
And each and every one of you, um, when you're working with people that are visually impaired, you can actually make that recommendation. You can help them go through NLS. Uh, and as a, as a um, provider, you can say, you know, they have low vision or low hearing or whatever, or not low hearing, but, you know, you can get them the books or the magazines because you can uh, identify that you're able to help them with that. Next. And then, of course, we have um, some apps for O&M, and I'm sure there's even more than this. Um, these are just some that are pretty popular. Um, I, I think that uh, in, in my situation, working with low vision, I think one of the things that I would love to see is something that's a little bit more user-friendly and helpful. These are all very, very good. And I think the future of this is going to be beacons or some other method where a person might have, for example, something similar like a, um, um, a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, and maybe they're walking in an environment and they're going to get some kind of a notification or something that tells them to go one way or the other. Uh, maybe not so much, but I, I think there's a lot of change and a lot of good hope for the future. Next. Um, the Seeing AI app, um, I'm not sure how many of you might be familiar with this. Um, if you are, then we can skip past it. If you're not, um, can we just uh, do a show of hands? I'll pull mine up on the, my phone um, and we can uh, just show it real quick. Does anybody, anybody have uh, any experience with the Seeing AI app? Yes, I, I do. I'm sorry. Yes? No? Um, I've used it before. This is Meg. I, I used it with my student before she uses it. Okay. That, it, it, it's huge. Um, I'll show you real quick. So basically, that's what it looks like. I'm going to pull it up. Um, so I'm gonna divulge my bad habit to everyone in the room. I happen to like, my dentist is not gonna like this, but I happen to like something called something. I can't tell you what it is because I'm gonna use the app. So I'm coming on the app. I don't know if you can see this. I'm on the bottom down here. So this is the Seeing AI app that's open. So the first thing is text. The second one is continue uh, document. The third one is product code. Um, and um, let's see, we have uh, the person, money, uh, scene, and um, a couple other things that are on there now. So I'm going to go ahead and hit um, the barcode. Product. Okay. Processing. Not recognized. Oh, geez, nice. A minute ago, it was recognized. Okay, we're going to do it again. This is the only problem sometimes in the basement. Process. Large almond cinnamon roasted top. Okay, so what she said was large almond cinnamon roasted tub. So this is my weakness. So I have to hide it. So anyway, <laughs> they're really good. They're made by Giant Eagle, if anybody cares. Um, so the other one that I really like, besides the document reader, so we have this document reader. Um, I'm going to have document. This. No edges visible. But processing. Okay. And then it's going to start reading. I am an OT clinical expert, low vision rehab team leader for the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center Centers for Rehab Service. Okay, so it reads and you can do a, um, a short text, you can do a long text. What I also Person. like, this is really fun. So I don't, I'm not, face, I don't know faces. what it's going to say about me, but One here we face go. near left edge, one face near center, processing. 51 year old woman with brown hair wearing glasses looking happy. Well, Zero I will faces. I will have to tell you that's younger than I am, so I'm very happy we made that work today. Um, <clears throat> another app in that same category, one if you're not familiar near, with this, is called SuperSense. Is anyone familiar with that one, SuperSense? Uh, basically, I'm going to pull it up and we're going to have it read. It's very similar to the Seeing AI. It has just a few other things that are... Um, Smart scanner mode on. A document is detected. Please hold the phone one foot away and parallel to text. The guidance will help you until an accurate photo is taken. Move further away from the document. Document detected. Tam an OT clinical expert low vision rehab team leader for the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center Centers for rehab services. Anyway, so that was just <clears throat> another example. So I think the benefits of these are that we can actually help people right where they're at. You know, we can give them opportunities um, if they have cell phones, you know, smartphones, 
Uh, again, the Seeing AI app, uh, for those of you who may know, uh, was developed by Microsoft and it was developed by a gentleman that had low vision himself. They and and uh, he was able to help them engineer this pro product. I think it's tremendous. It has multiple languages. I was very surprised at how many different languages it's available in now. So again, this is the this is what I'm always hopeful for that we're actually looking at um, creating things that are wonderful that can be obviously it costs money to have the phone. But when you look at this technology back in you know 30, 40, 50 years ago, it was worth over half a million dollars, and now it's on an iPhone that's and that you know it's free. And for those of you that um, are familiar with you know OCR technology. Um, the applications for that are still like $99, you know, if, if you if you um, download that particular application. I'm sorry, just lost the, the name of it. Um, that was hugely successful early on. Um, but anyway, so that's that's something to be thinking about too. Next. Um, again, back to the O&M, I'm sure you probably have heard about the WeWalk uh, smart cane. So I think what's very um, nice about this type of idea is the fact that they're thinking they're 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 looking at engaging um, you know the client uh, engaging uh, certainly the professionals uh, the O and M specialist to be able to design things and I, I think um, from my experience as an OT working in low vision I think it's hugely important to 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 help participate in those types of discussions and being involved in the research because I think you bring such a valuable aspect to that um, obviously when you have scientists get together and they have an idea you know it's great that they have an idea, but if they don't consider all of the, um, uh, you know, the detail that goes with that idea, including consideration for age, consideration for, uh, you know, cognitive capacity, then they might be seeing uh, two different things. They might be thinking one thing and, and implementing something that has absolutely no value whatsoever. Um, and I can speak to that when we talked about the iris vision device. Uh, next. And um, I came across uh, the podcast because I drive uh, about 37 miles one way to work every day. I don't live in Pittsburgh. I live in uh, the suburb of New Stanton uh, in that area. And so it's a, it's a ways for me every day. And so I, I really um, like to participate in podcast listening because it seems so nice to, to learn something on the road. Um, and I heard, um, again, this goes back to the uh, InData project um, uh, from Easter Seals in, in Indiana. Um, so this discussion was about how Alexa, especially during the pandemic, um, the idea of this uh, assistive technology developing as a companion um, for people who can't get out, it, it was huge. And I think if you're interested in reading the article, it, um, it warrants additional studies. So I, I realize you're all in school and you might not want to consider you know, looking at studies or being involved in yet one more research idea. But um, I think this uh, in the future, uh, there's about four things that I think of immediately. Number one, I think it's it's it could be very helpful to people who are marginalized or people who are are kind of feeling like they're left out because they have a vision impairment or they have other issues. I think it, it could also be very, very helpful to um, uh, look at the cognitive status of someone and maybe Alexa then, you know, does a daily reminder for, you know, whatever. Um, and she just went off here because she heard me say her name. But, um, you know, I, I think that the, you know, we have to be very careful, obviously, with ethics and, and you know, we don't want to uh, compromise anyone whatsoever or compromise uh, a person's privacy. But I think that there could be great benefits to this. And this article just uh, was really um, interesting. And I think for me, it brought to my mind that I didn't realize um, some of the statistics that they talk about um, uh, with regard to you know, the people living alone. Um, you know, and, and I'm gonna just give you some information from that. Um, it's taking uh, assistive technology to a whole new level by boosting disabled people's emotional well-being and staving off loneliness, in addition to helping them accomplish important daily tasks. Um, there's 83.1 million users uh, in the United States alone. The Amazon Echo is very much a mainstream device, but it's a life-changing impact uh, it's had in promoting disabled persons' independence at home to date cannot be overstated. Through simple voice activation, uh, Alexa yields up instant access to podcasts, music, audiobooks, and news stories, but there's much, much more than that. The technology can be an accessible and energy-saving centralized hub for the smart home of the future. 
Um, and I think that there was an article um, in the Journal of Psychology and Marketing uh, in December that really uh, talks more about that, that rather than just focusing on what it can practically do for people, it's actually helping them uh, form genuine emotional bonds with their intelligent uh, personal assistants. So we can go to the next one. You know, and, and how we talk about this is um, loneliness. It's a genuine scourge with, uh, within the disability community. According to a 2017 survey undertaken by the Pan Disability Charity Scope, over a typical day, one in eight disabled people experience less than a half an hour of interaction with another person. And that is huge. That is huge. And that's very sad. Uh, additionally, 85% of the young disabled adults aged 18 to 34 may report feeling lonely. And it carries with obviously um, significant uh, challenges uh, and it can also lead to, you know, the, the risk of a dementia later in life. And again, I realize you're, you're working with transitions and we're hoping that, you know, you're, uh, the, the student is being able to access all of the great technology and, and you know, to their benefit and, and to help them identify their own skills and their own strategies so that they can be successful moving forward. Next. And again, these are just um, some obviously simple ideas of the technology that you're probably already familiar with. Um, the up and on the left, this is my kind of deal. Like, <laughs> um, I'm not exactly the world's greatest cook, nor do I ever want to be. But um, I think what's beautiful about this <laughs> idea is that if you have the money at the moment, I think it's around $3,000, which I would never invest that much. But the point being, um, somehow the, the oven along with an app is actually being able to take the food that you put in it and actually sense it and actually cook it and, and, you know, prepare it the way it should be so that it's, you know, well done and, you know, so on and so forth. So if, if that's the case, you know what, I think the future, if they can make it um, accessible financially for everyone, there's going to be a lot of things that, that people are going to be able to accomplish that we can't even really identify at this moment. So again, these are just, uh, you know, great things that we're looking at. And, and uh, if you're not familiar with it, there's lots of great ways to learn about it. Next. Um, of course, Amazon Echo, that's a, a you know, it's a, it's a product that can actually identify what it's looking at. An OCR feature. Next. And again, in our in our area, these are three wonderful things that we're looking at right now. So I don't know if you're familiar with the Iris Vision device, but this is a great, great, great um, uh, device that can help uh, transition students. So basically, it is a head-mounted um, electronic magnifier. So it uses. Um, uh, a gaming kind of a headset and it also uses a um, it's an Android phone, but um, the actual application uh, was developed by uh, Frank Werblin and his team. I actually got to meet Frank, uh, Dr. Werblin. I um, he came to Pittsburgh and I had a discussion with him and I said, you know, we really ought to think about doing some research about how, um, you know, the device can help people. So it took us a little while to get it off the ground, but we are in, involved in a research study. And our point is, you know, does the device actually do what it says it's supposed to do? Does it help a person identify faces? Is it actually able to help um, someone engage in writing and, you know, uh, medication management? And does it really help with uh, um, uh, eye-hand coordination? So those are some of the areas that we're looking at. Um, when the device first came to us, uh, probably about three, three and a half, four years ago, um, one of the things that I mentioned to them, of course, I have to watch what I mentioned because sometimes people take the idea and then <laughs> your idea is gone, but it's okay. Um, I said they, they had a remote control. So I'm not a gamer, but they had a remote control. And I said, look, I said, if you're trying to make this for older people, this goes back to how important it is to have a team approach when you're looking at the development of a product. I said, older people may not know about using this uh, coordination device, this little um, remote control. I said, why don't you make it voice activated? Because that way, you know, they don't necessarily have to move their hands or if they're, you know, if they have uh, challenges with mobility. So anyway, Lo and behold, the latest device now has actually voice activation. You have to tap it, but once you tap it, it's voice activated, just like your phone. So again, these are um, products that are coming out on the market. And again, that, as far as I'm concerned, that Iris Vision, um, we had a, a gentleman who was 14, 15 years old at the time when it came out. And he was from actually from um, a different state. 
in New Jersey and he came to our clinic and he was the youngest person that in the very first person that we actually got the device for. So what it does is it through the programming, it can it has different modes in it. You can use near, intermediate, and distance vision. You cannot walk in it, obviously, um, if, you know, for any concern about that, walking would be detrimental to your health. Uh, however, it does have a strap on it now, like a binocular pair. So if you're <clears throat> going through, maybe you're going to a museum, maybe you're going to an outdoor event, you can have it around your, you know, being, and then just put it up when you need to use it. But you can use an RP mode, you can use a bioptic mode, it can do, a re, it can be OCR. You can actually, um, if you subscribe to Netflix, you can actually watch Netflix in it, excuse me. <coughs> so it's, it's really great. And the iPad, we've done a lot of different things, um, helping people access print just by the iOS system by itself, uh, between Zoom and Magnify, and then of course, um, seeing AI. The OrCam My i2. <coughs> is um, a device that's actually, it's about the size of a, a USB drive and it's magnetic and it goes to the side of the glasses. Now this is an older one that this gentleman's wearing. <clears throat> the one that he's wearing actually was probably the, the alpha model, the very first model that came out. Now it's all wireless and you can actually um, have you know wireless earbuds to go with it so that if you're pointing basically you tap on it and you point to what it what you want it to read and then it reads to you and it you know in your ear you doesn't have to be so everybody hears it but it's um it's hugely valuable because a lot of times people want to look you know like everybody else and they're being able to wear the glasses and they don't have to worry about anything going with them in the you know environment um so that's that's uh, a huge uh, you know uh, move forward with people with for, with vision impairment and I've, and the thing about the OrCam is it's a great device. Um, there are you know it, it is costly. It costs about forty five hundred for that particular um, outfit, and you know the thing that concerns it's not concerned but the thing that we always um, consider when we're working with a patient is if they have a smartphone, uh, for example, the uh, Apple, if they have the Apple product, you know, how different is the Apple product with the seeing AI than the OrCam? So again, you know, you weigh out all these things, you weigh out the ease of use, use utility of it, you know, is a person going to be able to immediately go home and use it and the training and all this kind of thing. So that's a big, big thing for us because we don't want uh, device abandonment because clearly if they've got funding for this or family members or what have you, someone help pay for this, you know, we don't want them to put it on the shelf and say, we're not going to use it. So next. And then this is just a, a couple of quick slides about um, working and how important, you know, your job is to encourage people in the transition age. Um, you know, these uh, particular uh, statistics came from AFB. And, you know, um, for the for the uh, young woman that was on the call with her son, I, I don't necessarily, I, I think a lot of it has to do with how we look at a person's capacity and, you know, how they're engaged in the growing up process, you know, who, who is mentoring them, um, what uh, access do they have to, um, you know, knowing about things in the world and all this kind of thing. Because I think, you know, in look, reading this, it's kind of, it, you know, it, it, it's interesting to me because I think if you're in the right situation, that maybe this doesn't even enter into the, as a factor, you know, as far as whether your person's going to work or not work. I think, um, the, you know, certainly in the school system, you know, the, the, the counseling and the uh, TVI and the O&M, everybody has a great role to help that person. But it's, it's, it's not just, you know, it's, it's a collaborative effort. So we, even if you have all those things working in the school, you still have the family to take care of. You still have the family to, to, to concern yourself with, with regard to how that all goes together for the student and for the child. Um, but I, I think anyway, regardless, it, it's great to know that you are a part of that and that you can encourage people to, to actually achieve the best that they can for themselves. And then that's kind of like what OT does. And I think that's just huge. You know, you know, even looking at these statistics, you know, when I worked in long-term care, you know, you, you don't just have all of these people that are in long-term care. You have people that are older that have had challenges in their life, they end up in long-term care, but not everybody who's 85 has had the same problem. So, and again, we, we know that we can all think for ourselves, but I, I think it's important to, to just know that you have a great role and that if you can help someone to achieve, you know, whatever independence they need to be able to go and get employment, um, it, it's huge. It, it's so life-changing for that person. Next. 
and these are just a couple of the examples. Um, I didn't realize that everybody has, a, you know, the state all has different work programs. Um, and of course, because I'm listening to the Indata program from Easter Seals, which happens to be located in the state of Indiana, you know, this is um, the work to include program is just huge. And, and, and again, this is kind of one of those things that I feel I wish that it was universal across the United States, because again, it's kind of like, you know, you're all going to be expert, whether you stay in Pennsylvania or you go out of state, you all have great knowledge bases and you're going to help people. And you, you know, I encourage you to really know as much as you can about the resources you have in your community and your state, because, you know, a lot of times people aren't aware of things. And a lot of times that simple awareness can make the difference between being in part A and being over here, you know, so next. Again, you can um, find more information out about all these things. So there's a really nice PowerPoint <clears throat> that um, they, they um, uh, did for the uh, Pennsylvania uh, folks that also work with um, transition so that you might know about that already. Um, again, these are just um, some, some very helpful uh, websites. Next. So we're gonna to get to some of the fun stuff again. So um, again, for most of you, uh, if you're familiar with, uh, obviously if you're, you know, you work in low vision and you're familiar with bioptics, you know that there's a certain uh, set of things that have to happen when you're working with um, distance vision and you're trying to help someone use a bioptic. So if you're not familiar with bioptic driving, we're gonna talk about that. Um, so the bioptic driving, you know, a lot of times when we say the word bioptic driving, people get nervous because they think that, oh my gosh, someone who has low vision is driving. Well, when you think about what the bioptic does and you think about correlating or you know, looking at that same process as someone who might have a bifocal, it's very kind of, you know, it's similar. So you're not, if you're wearing a bifocal, you're not going to walk around looking through the reading part. If you walk around looking through the lower part of the reading part of your glasses, you're going to fall. So with a bioptic, you're always going to look through the carrier lens until you absolutely have to dip your head down and look through the bioptic to be able to see something in the distance to then make a decision about your driving, whatever you're doing. So basically, <clears throat> the bioptic driver uses the bioptic portion of the lens, uh, the glasses that are, uh, you know, fabricated, uh, less than 5% of the time. And maybe sometimes they're not hardly even using a 1%, depending on where they're driving and depending on how well that person knows that area. Next. So they, we really didn't have the capacity to drive in Pennsylvania with bioptic um, driving. Um, how I got interested and in, invited in this uh, was about four years ago. What year is this? 21. Yes. In 2017, actually in probably 2016, the fall of 2016, um, we started talking about bioptic driving. So there was a group of us, um, Dr. Paul Freeman, who is a optometrist that works out of Allegheny General. Uh, so he's in that uh, uh, setting. And uh, Amy Lane, who is a certified driving rehab specialist. So she uh, works for the adaptive driving program out of the CAT lab at Pitt and myself. Um, so Dr. Freeman was part of the medical advisory board at uh, PennDOT. And he had and talked to Amy Lane and worked with Amy Lane many, many years um, with regard to her program because he would make a lot of referrals to her for people that have stroke and different vision uh, challenges. Well, I got involved because I was interested in bioptics and I really wanted to see you know, where this was gonna go. So we started meeting um, and in 2016. And there's, um, for those of you who know Chuck Huss, which you probably know Chuck Huss, if you're an O&M person, because um, Chuck Huss is kind of like the, in my opinion, when you look at all the things that he's done in his career, he's kind of like the, the father of developing bioptic driving. So he is located in West Virginia. And he had, a, he has had a program since I think 1985. And um, he's absolutely wonderful. And um, he has been so helpful to Amy and myself. So we got invited to go to his program. So if you ever get, in, and I know he's gonna be retiring at the end of the year. So I'm just mentioning this, if you have any desire or any interest or know any, anyone that might wanna go and learn about the bioptic driving program in West Virginia before he retires, you know, go for it. We were able to spend three days there. We learned an awful lot about what he does. We learned about how active he is with developing other programs like the one in Texas. 
Um, so he's hugely responsible for, you know, promoting this idea of bioptic driving and helping the student. He is so, he is so dedicated. His passion, you know, you, you talk to him for five minutes and you just know that he, this guy is just tremendously valuable, tremendously helpful and, and very, very passionate and, and he cares. And so he's helped us with this whole bioptic pro process. So he's uh, very much involved. So basically what we've done is we, we came together as a, a bioptic study group. We've been meeting regularly. And the last time we went to Harrisburg before the pandemic was, I believe it was either the spring or the fall of 2019. It's kind of a blur right now. But we would go to these meetings that they had with, with you know, the advisory board and all these, you know, different people were on this meeting. So at that meeting, it was presented to us that finally the idea of the bioptic driving was going to be put on the table. So to me, put on the table means, okay, whatever. I thought, you know, okay, five, six years down the road. You know, we were never expecting that in the fall of 2020 that the, the bioptic driving HB 2296 got shoved in. So that means that uh, the bioptic driving has passed in the state of Pennsylvania and actually um, it will go into 100% effect, uh, I believe it's September 27th, 2021. So it's not too far away. So between the time that it went into to, um, action in 20, last fall until now, our team has been working with PennDOT. We've been talking about how are we going to get people up to speed to know what this means? You know, what are the regulations? What does everybody have to know? This kind of thing, this kind of thing. So, <coughs> excuse me. What we did was we decided that we needed to have a seven, uh, one hour uh, a week lecture series, which actually started today. So from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. Uh, every Tuesday for seven weeks in a row, there will be lecture series. The first lecture was all on about vision and Dr. Paul Freeman did that one this morning. Next Tuesday's lecture is the low vision evaluation. Uh, the, the guy, Dr. William Smith, who's a low vision optometrist that I work with is gonna do that one. Um, the next one is about the bioptic, and that's going to be delivered by Dr. Aaron Kenny and then myself. The next two will be about uh, pre-driver readiness and the use of bioptic. And then the final two is going to be done by um, Amy Lane uh, with regard to uh, the driving aspect of the use of bioptics. So anyway, so it's huge. It, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a win. Um, I think it's uh, tremendously valuable. Again, it goes back to that whole idea I've said before. You know, we really want to encourage people to the best of their capacity so that they can become independent and, and, and be part of society and be part of the, you know, uh, you know be employed and, and have a, a self-worth and all these kind of things that employment gives you opportunities to, to then engage in bigger things in your life and, and, you know, have quality of life and all those kind of things. So it's pretty exciting. So we can go to the next um, slide. So <clears throat> obviously, you know, it seems like a lot of you already know about vision. So uh, clearly the bioptic driver is uh, using the device because they have a loss of central vision and they can still use their peripheral vision. So it's important to, to really know that. And so when we're talking about the bioptic, we're just actually trying to help someone see in the distance uh, to en enhance their capacity because they've lost some central vision. Next. Um, this is the, uh, the video and hopefully it'll go quickly because I'm hoping it works for you. <laughs> Yeah, just let me know if I should start it earlier than this. Okay. No, Across I think the street. Good. Yep, that's it. I'll show you what it looks like with the uh, telescopic glasses. And just to demonstrate how bioptic telescopic glasses work, uh, right now you're looking through the carrier lens of uh, parabioptics. And when we lower the telescope, you can see that the building across the street, that's my office, uh, gets bigger and easier to see. So here it is with the carrier lens. Here it is with the uh, bioptic telescope. So that's really all there is to using bioptics. You look through the carrier. When you need to see something a little bit better, something off at a distance, you lower your chin and you're looking through the uh, uh, telescopic part of the glasses. That's it. So I just wanted you to be able to see how that works. So you <coughs> Excuse me. show you what it looks like. Oh, sorry, with... working that now? Okay. 
So basically, um, the vision standards that have been set in the House Bill 2296 include that the, the best corrected visual acuity has to be 2200 in the best corrected eye. Uh, the bioptic telescope correction can't be any greater than 6x. And um, basically, it starts at 1.7. Uh, and per Dr. Smith, you know, uh, I've been working with him for several years. He thinks about a 2 to 2.5x is probably going to be the best because, again, when you think about magnification, if you get something at 6x, that means the visual field is going to be really small. So that's, you know, something else to think about. And then, again, um, I don't want to, to bore you with all the detail, but you have to, you know, be able to have 2050 daytime. Um, you know, 2040 daytime only with the possibility of dr night driving. So there, there are some restrictions um, and we can go to the next one. And again, this is all spelled out uh, in, in the um, H, you know, the 2296 house bill. Of course, the, the field rest requirement has not changed whatsoever. It's still 120 degrees and color vision just sufficient to respond to changes. And then you have to have the, the yearly vision test have to be determined, you know, continued every year to make sure that the vision isn't changing and that the bioptic is still viable. Next. So, uh, and, and again, um, I'm not sure uh, to everyone's knowledge base about driving training, but I'm just going to take a couple minutes and explain it. So our role, um, especially uh, because of being the CLVT and the fact that I have uh, education in um, low vision, um, I can actually participate in the passenger and car. And the other part of this um, for the O&Ms in the room, um, it's very important for you to know that in, in the future, if you would so be interested, you could approach um, one of these organizations or areas of expertise that is doing bioptic driving. And you could ask, you know, you know, maybe there's a referral source there for you because honestly, according to Chuck, which I totally agree with, you know, there, there is a, a, a good role there for you because you are, you are, um, you know, obviously when the person, the child is growing up through the system, you are the one that are, are doing all the um, education of the visual skills training that is, are necessary to use the bioptic, you know, such as the distance visions, uh, you know, viewing skills, critical object or condition awareness, you know, and, and, the, and so on. So the basic, just being able to use the bioptic by itself, you are, you know, able to do that. Um, so what I would do then, you know, the process of how it goes is Dr. Smith would evaluate the patient. I get the referral from Dr. Smith after he has assessed the patient and recognizes whether they are, first of all, they have to meet the vision criteria, right? We can't just put anybody out there. They have to meet the vision criteria. Then what happens is, um, you know, we have to do some work with them. We can't just say, okay, you got the bioptic, now you can go hop in the car and drive. We have to, we have to first of all, see, number one, if, if it's gonna be viable for them. So my job is to take the information from him. He has maybe uh, built up, you know, a trial frame with the, with the bioptic. You know, there's a couple different uh, um, uh, uh, houses of thought on this process. And I was with Dr. Smith, we kind of think of it in one sp uh, actual area and maybe somebody else on the Eastern side of the state may not think of it the same way. So when this all came about with the bioptic driving, we've kind of decided that we're gonna establish pods in the state of Pennsylvania. So our pod will be in Pittsburgh. So it'll be Dr. Smith, Dr. Freeman, Dr. myself, uh, Amy Lane. Okay, so people that might work out in Salis or people that might work out in the Eastern part of the state, they may not necessarily go through the whole thing like we're doing it. I mean, there's a basic way to do it in which everybody's gonna do, but we're looking at the consumer. We're looking at, okay, where, where are you gonna get the funding? So if it's, if it's a student, I'm sure that they, you know, there's OVR, there's there's different funding sources because clearly bioptics are not cheap. You know, they can be up to $4,000 or what have you. And then of course the training um, in the medical model, if you are looking at driving training, irregardless of what it is, there's no insurance that pays for that. If you are of working age or you're under OVR, then you might have some funding sources that will buy some time from the driver, you know, from Amy. So the OVR is um, positioning to, to help that person stay, you know, employed or get them a job, what have you, what have you. But if you're elderly and you don't fall into any of those categories, you have nobody to cover the money, you know, so it's like $120 an hour or what have you. So that's really important for you to know because this is one of the things that we're all coming up against. Well, there's no, there, who's going to pay for it, right? Who's going to pay for the time? Who's going to pay for the training? Who's going to pay for the device? So, <clears throat> 
anyway, in the passenger and car, you know, we can kind of look at the person. We, 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 we look at, you know, their capacity to use the bioptic, but as a therapist and as a clinician, you know, I first and foremost look at their cognition. I have to know whether this person is going to be <clears throat> safe, you know, whether they, they can maybe do the trails A and B, maybe they, they do the MOCA. If there's any indication that that person is not going to be able to do uh, the driving training, then we kind of look back at the process. We st st pull back and say, wait a minute, they may not be a good candidate for this. So we don't know if we're going to go forward with it. And then we go back to the team and we talk about, you know, what the next steps are. Do they need remediate, you know, do they need additional training? Do they need, you know, compensatory strategy training, or is this something that just should go away? It's not going to be a, a good idea for them. So anyhow, again, some of that might not be pertinent to you, but clearly, you know, there, there's multiple things involved in driving. It's not just about whether you're see well, you know, I mean, we all know that you have to have good reaction time, you have to have good cognition, you have to be able to think quickly, <clears throat> and that kind of thing. So we're doing the passenger and car, Amy would be doing the behind the wheel. And again, these are all of the, you know, some of the things that would happen in that uh, particular situation with behind the wheel training. Next. So one of the things that, you know, is very helpful to all of us now is the fact that technology has changed tremendously and they have, we have the mobile eye that's actually, a, you know, able to detect different things. If you have a newer car, it's, it's, it's already built into the, your car. Probably in a few years, there's going to be even more of this great technology that I presume will actually be able to help people that might have some vision challenges. It might even be built right into this, to the windshield, possibly. So you know, we have uh, some of these things, forward collision, lane departure, you know, a speed limit warning, all that kind of stuff. So it, it's moving in that direction. And I know even on the dashboards, there's some things that are a lot more easily seen than they used to be. So I, I think the the uh, auto industry is, is, is very forward thinking. Uh, there's a great organization in Michigan and they do a lot of, I think there's, uh, if you get a chance to listen to the lectures, the eye in the car, the eye in the auto, it's, it's fantastic because it talks about a lot of these things that, you know, we're thinking about with functional uh, community mobility. So next. So I think one of the things that people don't understand, not, not necessarily this group, but the general public, they don't see there's any reason why a person, you know, if you have mild to moderate level of uh, vision loss, why you should use a bioptic. So you don't have to necessarily meet uh, the, I mean, you can be better, you can have better vision than what's required by the state to use a bioptic and still use a bioptic. And, and Dr. Smith and I have this conversation a lot when we talk about this program, because the thing is, a bioptic device could actually be an assistive device to help someone who maybe doesn't have the, the, you know, what the state says you have to have to drive with it, they have better vision than that, but they're using it to, to help themselves be a little bit more safe with the driving component. So that's why we, we think, you know, you don't necessarily, no, you don't have to have that vision and just only use it then. We have people that want to be better at driving and they want to, you know, they know that they can accomplish something. Next. Um, yeah, so this is basically, uh, you know, it helps the user increase their margin of safety. So it does, it, it is a very useful and helpful device. Next. So when you, when you look at these two pictures, so the one on the right, um, there is not, you know, the bioptic is not being used, but the one on the left, you can see that it, it brings everything a little bit closer and it kind of helps, you know, you to be able to make a decision. So you're looking at the work site you're seeing, you know, someone and you're able to, to recognize it quickly and then you can, uh, you know, make a decision about what you want to do. Next. And then this one, um, again, the one on the left, you know, it's kind of like the crest of the hill. You can't really tell, but if you look in the, the picture on the right, you can notice that there, you know, you're able to see that there's a car coming and, you know, uh, you can kind of make, again, make a decision with that three second dip, you know, looking through the bioptic. And again, um, just to let you know, the, a lot of this information with the bioptics, um, Chuck and I, you know, work together. He's actually uh, been very, very helpful in, in giving information because he wants people to know as much as about it as possible. So the next slide gives us just a, a real quick idea of how it's changed. So even if you don't read what it says on the slide, on the left slide, all the yellow states, that's all you could do with driving, 13 states in 1983. In 2021, everybody but Utah and Iowa allows uh, bioptic driving. So that's huge. 
And this just gives you, um, you know, again, I don't know where everybody's going to end up, but this is good resource information for the future. It gives you um, the acuity levels uh, for restricted driving privileges by each state. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. And then again, um, this is just another picture of how the, the, the acuity standards have uh, expanded. And I, I, I foresee, this is um, just my opinion, this is giving you just a, an overview of the people that worked on this project. Um, I think that probably within 10 years, because of this push for the um, automatic driving, you know, the car, driverless car, that there's probably going to be some type of technology. Well, maybe 10 years is too soon. Between 10 and 15 and maybe 20 at the most, I think that there's going to be some kind of technology that might be able to be used in the car that can actually help someone who has the need for the bioptic now. And maybe it just comes into the windshield. Maybe, maybe there's some way that the magnification occurs quickly. Who knows? But I, I think it's going to be different. So, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, on the road to a great journey. So again, these are all the folks that worked on the uh, driving, uh, the work study committee. And again, if it wouldn't be for Chuck, I mean, he's very, very uh, approachable, uh, tremendously helpful and, and, and very kind. He's very much about helping uh, the student be able to be independent in driving. Next. So um, this is just for your information, just in case you have a student that's interested in what they have to be able to do. They have to you know, meet all of these criteria. Um, and we kind of talked about that already. Uh, next. And again, this is again, more information about the permit. So they have to, they have, to have the bioptic for three months, okay? Um, including the certification of a successful completion. They have to work with a, uh, a person such as myself or someone else in that role um, for the 10 hours of in front uh, seat passenger, you know, passenger and car instruction. And then they have to, um, you know, complete the pre-driver readiness, you know, learning all about the distance viewing skills, critical object and condition awareness skills and basic bioptic use. And then they have to apply for the, uh, the learner's permit. Next. Um, then they will uh, work 20 hours behind the wheel with someone such as Amy. And then they have to log additional time. And then they have to have, you know, someone sign off on their, uh, you know, driver reevaluation indicating that they've had satisfactory 65 hours of training. Next. And then they have to pass the test. And once they pass the test and the, the criteria will be as listed on their license. Uh, and clearly, we are not uh, suggesting anyone should ever think that they could drive a motorcycle or, you know, you know, drive a big rig. So next. Um, and then again, this is just a little bit about the non-restriction. Um, you have to complete one year of uh, accident free uh, and, and moving violation free. And then you can go a reevaluation and you um, again for unrestricted uh, daytime privileges. Next. And can I ask a question? Yes. Yep. 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 So my son is the one that's visually impaired. Yes. Joanna. Um. So he has a license. It's restricted to daylight only. Okay. Um. He does not use a bioptic. Okay. And really, he only goes from home to school. Okay. Which is a couple miles and. Okay maybe just, you know, within 10 miles, he goes. However, he wants, you know, he wants to get a job, like a part-time job. And I guess the problem, like we're really trying to find a job that doesn't require nighttime driving. Okay. So he, like we talked to the local restaurant and they said, well, his shift would be three to 11. Mm. so then it's like well we could pick him up but we don't want to you know that he's really independent sure 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 so when when he got his license he goes to um dr hacker okay erica hacker yep yeah and she showed us bioptics but mm -hmm. she never told us about this training or anything well she, us and then we would pay out of pocket it's brand new 
This hasn't even really gone into effect until September 27th. That's why oh, she didn't okay. tell you. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that just so you don't think she didn't she didn't tell you. She didn't know. <laughs> we <Okay>. didn't know. <laughs> so. so are you saying that if you drive with a bioptic, you can get that restriction lifted? You have or to, is he always going to have that restriction because no, of his contrast? Yeah, he um, he would he has to meet the criteria to get the restriction lifted. Yeah, yeah. And I think that actually, um, if you want to send me an email privately after this, um, I can get you. You know, we're we're you know, so the the other part of this is that we're pioneers, <laughs> you know, and so I'm so blessed to be able to share all this with you because I think that. Um, just as you say, you know, this is, this is huge for your son. This is a, a, another step of independence. And I, I want to compliment you, Joanna, because, you know, I don't want anyone coming out of this conversation today thinking that I am biased or thinking that I'm, um, I have disregard for people that have challenges in their family system. But I think that it is so, you know, this is so OT. This is so you doing OT, encouraging your son, giving him opportunities, letting him grow, letting him be, you know, the person that he is. And it just, you know, if we were in person, I'd probably give you a hug because I think that that is so, so valuable. And, and, and what I see, and, I, and I'm not going to, you know, there's been a few students that I've seen that that your behavior and what you're telling me now did not happen in that family. And to right. me, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. everyone on the call knows what I'm talking about. They are, there are self-induced barriers in a family system. And to me, my job as a clinician is to provide hope. You know, when I see people coming, you know, I see people of, you know, the older population, especially, but it doesn't matter. Hope is hope. If you're 10 years old or you're 90 years old, I want to provide hope so that you don't feel that all your, you know, answers to life is in one particular box. You have multiple mm -hmm. boxes. And so you're doing a, a great job. So I appreciate that. And, and it's a great question, but you can email me because we're going to get back to you on that. So you're, so you're in Pittsburgh, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that you need to come to Dr. Smith, but I think it would be great. But the point being, <laughs> you know, because we're doing this, you know, biopic stuff, you know, right. let's, let's figure it out together so we can help your son. That's what I'm trying to get at. You know, I'll be happy it, to, to help you with that. Okay, perfect. Um, and just one more example that may be the, the other TVIs and ONMs would think of, but um, he just got his license like not long ago. And anyways, um, he couldn't drive in the winter because mm. he leaves for school at 7 a.m. Oh yeah, and it was still dark. dark out. Yep. So when the semester changed, his schedule changed, and he had a study hall study hall first period. So I asked. I kind of told them that this is the way it's going to be is that just let him forget the study hall and come in when it's light out. Mm -hmm. So um, he did that for a while. He would go in at eight o'clock mm -hmm. and he was. Cause I'm not like giving him, he doesn't want his mom and dad driving him to school anymore <laughs> when he's in 11th grade. Yeah. Um, so anyways, they, the school didn't really have a problem with it. Okay. Um, and now that it's light out at 7 a.m., he drives at 7 a.m. Sure. sure. But there's always like ways around it. Mm -hmm. But he did ask me, he said, next year, what am I going to do? Because right. I won't have a study hall first period. Right. So we have to like deal with this again. Sure. Next year, how is he going to get to school? Oh boy, that's my phone going off. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, usually I don't get anybody calling me, especially when I'm a, a, an old fashioned phone here. Hold on a minute. I'm going to shut that phone off. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, remember the story I told everyone about my father-in-law? Well, guess what? That was his phone from his workshop. 
because even though he had vision impairment, he was an expert craftsman at making things out of wood. He could look at a picture and, and build whatever you want. So when he passed away, I said, I want the phone because it just brings me back to the, his, his big workshop and how he called people anyway. Anyway, so you got to hear the old fashioned phone. Um, but yeah, so I, I think that, that that's very, very important. And again, the pre-driver readiness is, you know, the O&M specialist, you know, that, you know, um, obviously travel skills, you know, I'm not going to do the travel skill part. I'm doing the, the capacity for them to scan and to look forward and all that kind of stuff, because you have to, you definitely have to know how to, to be able to use a bioptic. Um, and as Dr. Freeman said, uh, even this morning, you know, just because a person can use a bioptic doesn't mean they can drive. And we know all what that means, <laughs> you know, and, and obviously we're not going to um, pass somebody through a system unless it's quite evident that they are capable to be able to use that bioptic without flaw. So that's, that's important. Um, so pre-driver readiness is really important. Next. And again, we can, yeah, kind of look at this. Um, for us, it's not just about um, the vision. Um, really, it's, a, it's about everything. It's about reaction time. It's about um, the capacity for the person to, sorry about the phone. <laughs> It's about the capacity for the person to make decisions, critical thinking, being able to be quick on your feet, being able to be, you know, react, um, and also to identify a situation that could be, you know, dangerous. You know, how are you going to, situational awareness, how are you going to be able to, to identify that that's going to be a problem? Next. And again, we kind of just talked about that, distance viewing, critical object or situational and the bioptic use. Next. Um, again, why is this important? Because, you know, of course your son already has his license, but you know, it helps to, to reduce the, the driver's training. Uh, it improves opportunity and success. And obviously a driver, you know, the person's of a capacity to get driver's license next. Um, so this is what you can get from Chuck. Um, I think it's very, very valuable. Um, he did a tremendous job and you can also reach out to the to Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. They have a great program there. They're very willing to help T tsbvi.edu. Um, they're just a tremendous organization. Um, next. So, and then this was some, uh, obviously this was uh, provided to me by Chuck. This is not anybody I know, but this is something that uh, he'd like to share with everyone. Yes, it's very important. No matter how old you are, um, it's important to, to uh, recognize the level of independence you can achieve if you're able to drive again. Uh, and there's always, you know, two sides to the coin about driving. So even if um, you have a student that kind of, eh, you know, they're not sure they want to drive, you know, driving is expensive. So, you can kind of work out, you know, a workaround about it. If a person is a little bit on the fence and they're not sure they want to drive, you know, if you live in a metropolitan area or you have access to tremendous public transportation, you know, looking at a, you know, like a spreadsheet and looking at all the options could be very helpful to the student, even, even in the fact that if they do want to pursue bioptic driving, they still have looked at all the other options that are available. So I think it's a great, uh, a great exercise in capacity to, to problem solve. So it's always uh, helpful. Next. And then this is just a couple little quick slides I want to share about the low vision. Um, you know, for people that you might be around and uh, so on and so forth with the population, it's, it's really important to, to understand that it's not, you know, clearly you all work with, you know, the, 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 the children, you know, people that are growing up with the, the low vision. But this is a, you know, a, a big, huge situation in our our. our country. Um, and the biggest thing that I get concerned about is diabetes. So even if you, you have children you might be working with now, you might be getting children that end up having uh, developed diabetes and then obviously diabetic retinopathy and conditions with vision loss um, are huge. Uh, I think one of the things that's under discussed in our country is the fact that between diabetes and hypertension, the amount of vision loss that can occur is, is tremendous. And, and I don't think people realize that. Um, but anyway, uh, next. Again, it's, it's very expensive, uh, you know, 
the big thing that I wanted to share with recently, um, last week I had a opportunity to, with a, the vision team that I work with, and we got to meet with the FDA uh, because uh, the University of Pittsburgh has been awarded some huge funds um, from the FDA to to look at vision and vision impairment and, and you know doing some uh, great things for vision loss and so one of the big things that they talked about in, in this meeting was the focus on uh, patient reported outcomes which is huge and also involving the patient when we're looking at research you know looking at how their input can help drive you know like uh, further development of you know interventions further development of um, the strategies and the techniques, as, as well as how do we how do we measure whether the intervention was worth it or whether it was a successful intervention. And then the other thing is um, one of the things that I did with a colleague of mine in our department uh, the last year, we were awarded the Beckwith Foundation um, a grant during COVID, and we um, promoted the idea of telerehabilitation services for low vision um, using the iPads. And so they also talked about how important, you know, looking at that concept is to, to help um, the underserved. Okay, next. And again, this is just a, a for your information. Again, you're working with students that have vision impairment. And obviously, you know, we, when we look at low vision, we kind of have three, I, I think three different um, uh, Travel sources, I guess, is a good way to think about it, or three different veins of, of vision impairment. You have a child that has a genetic, uh, you know, deterioration of vision impairment, perhaps. You have a middle-aged person that might have gotten a traumatic injury, and then you have the older person that's dealing with um, age-related, uh, you know, vision impairment. But nevertheless, um, this gives you an overview of some of the things that we are concerning ourselves with. Uh, next slide. And again, for us, you know, we are a medical model, so we can uh, receive referrals from anyone on the left uh, with regard to low vision services. It didn't come about till about 2002 that we were allowed to take uh, referrals from optometrists. I think I mentioned that. Uh, next. And then this is what we've done in the past uh, since I've been working with uh, UPMC since 2013. Uh, one of the very first patients, that's how I got involved with UAB. Uh, we were trained on how to um, treat this person that had the implantable miniature telescope. So basically what that is, if you think about a person getting a cataract remove, basically um, this was during a cataract removal procedure where this um, a uh, medical device was implanted. It is basically a 2.2x magnifier that goes into the eye where the cataract, you know, where the lens would be planted. And it has to be in uh, the, obviously the worst seeing eye. And um, what happens is then when you train the person, they have um, two different um, abilities. They have a near ability with their right, well, with a particular person had a right eye. Anyway, so the, the implant eye would be the near vision and then um, the other, the non-implant eye would be um, the distance vision. So it's a, it's a process of training a person, which is kind of you know challenging because your brain works a little bit different. So you have to really work at it. Um, and, and, you know, it has been tested and used, uh, you know, the FDA has uh, encouraged, you know, uh, the ability to be used. But the one thing I want to mention is even though it's a great product, maybe um, the concern that I have, again, when we talk about ma manufacturing and presenting these types of devices to people. So you're giving hope to someone, right? But the problem with the device is that even though they have macular degeneration and this is getting implanted, the macular degeneration does not stop. So even though this is kind of like helping a person magnify things to see, you know, clearly they can still have scotomas develop and, and it doesn't fix, obviously fix the problem and it can actually, you know, things can change. So it, it's, it needs to be clear in the explanation to a person whenever they're undergoing a process like this. You know, they have to have 100% consent. They have to, in my opinion, they have to 100% understand what the outcome could be from this uh, research or this product or whatever. Because, you know, sometimes, you know, not everybody has the greatest intentions. And sometimes it's an intention of a manufacturer to get to the top and win the race. And it's not necessarily consideration of the patient. And it, it frustrates me. So I'm very much an advocate for the patient. But anyway. Um, next. So the other one that we're involved in now is the Pixium uh, research, which uh, a picture here, you can see that the implant is very, very small. Um, it's a subretinal implant and it's um, powered by, um, um, excuse me, the beam. <laughs> I just lost the word. Uh, and the goal is to elicit functional artificial vision um, because of the uh, IR beam. 
uh, you know, exciting the damaged retinal tissues. And it actually is having some outcome. It's very impressive. Um, but again, when we talk about this type of vision, we're not thinking that all of a sudden someone's going to wake up and they're going to see a person's face. We're talking about very, very, very basic vision where they're looking at the land alt C, they're looking at bars, they're looking at, you know, very, very simple uh, images and perceptions of vision but they weren't seeing before. So it is kind of taking the person who can be considered very super low vision, like 20 over a thousand, 20 over 500. And now maybe they're at, you know, 2,400. So next. And then the GenSite, um, this is an intraocular injection and it combines gene therapy with optogenetics uh, for people that have retinitis pigmentosa. So it's kind of, it's a really cool thing too. Uh, next. So this is the, the, and those two projects we are providing the rehabilitative services for, and this one also. So the iris vision study, that's the iris vision. That's the one that we're involved in in the occupational therapy department as well. And then the, um, the iPad is what we did with the uh, Beckwith project uh, you know, using telerehabilitative services. Next. And um, I know I've talked a lot. I'm very sorry. I'm very passionate about this. And I would, if anyone has any more questions, please, uh, it's time to fire them up. I feel bad that I've talked so long. <laughs> My goodness, got four minutes, huh? I hope it was informative. And again, um, I think especially in the, in the city of Pittsburgh. Again, I, I don't know. I presume that you know all about the big building. I presume that everyone knows about the vision restoration tower that's being built and, and what the, the premise is there um, is, a, is a collaborative effort with Dr. Sahil's group and, and you know the vision restoration team and, and occupational therapy and physical therapy and speech therapy. They're all gonna be housed in that building. Um, I actually was part of uh, some of the planning committee for the space. Uh, Dr. Smith and I actually went down to the space last week and we had our hard hats on and we were looking, it was, it was really impressive. I think it, for those of you who are staying in the city of Pittsburgh, I think we are um, about to be, uh, you know, we're already on the map, but I think, you know, this particular institution is replacing the steel industry. I think we're very lucky and we're very blessed. And by any means, if there's anybody that has questions in the future, if there's any way I can help you, please don't hesitate to ask. I'll be happy to do so. And I appreciate, you know, all your time and your attention and we can go to the next yeah. slide. Um, and then just a couple of cool slides, yeah. you know. And um, again, the last slide is uh, mostly about uh, resources. And again, most of everything. Oh, I wanted to mention one thing. So when you're talking about um, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, the abilities that you're each using, whether you're a TVI, whether you're an O&M specialist, whether you're the um, counselor. So there's a wonderful organization that again, I listen to podcasts. Um, it's called bridgingapps.org. So if you come across that, if you have a moment to look that up, that, that website is an organization of people that come together to try to help and vet apps that are very useful for people of all kinds. It's kind of like a universal build in that uh, that whole model there because they're looking at people that have vision impairment, people that have cognition impairment, people that have you know autism, people that have you know physical limitations, hearing limitations. And it's beautiful because they go through and they look at the apps and they say, well, yeah, this is okay. And most of them are free. And something, you know, um, even the fun stuff. So there's a, there's a great one on there if, if, for the TVIs who maybe work with children or it doesn't have to be children. I use it with the elderly. I think it's great. So a lot of times people miss the ability to do some of the fun stuff that they used to do. So example, jigsaw puzzles. So now if you go to puzzlebug, you know, it's an app, it's free. You can get it on an iPad and you can build a puzzle from a beautiful picture. It can either be four pieces and the pieces are either traditional or ones that are easy for, for children that can't necessarily have good grasp. And then you can go from a puzzle of four pieces to a puzzle of 300 pieces. So again, that, that website is just tremendously valuable. And I encourage you to get a chance to, to look at that. And also if you um, uh, check out the um, uh, assistive technology at Easter Seals Crossroads, they, they, their podcasts are, are priceless. You know, the things that you learn, um, I, I learned just the other day about a reading uh, organization. So there's a guy that's using a, a gaming um, platform 
And so he's trying to help people that have dyslexia. So he's doing this gaming platform to help kids learn how to, to recognize words that are very familiar anyway. So those are the kind of things that, that come across with the podcast. So I think it's very helpful if you like that kind of thing. But any, and do, does anybody have any questions? I know we're running out of time, but uh, I, I hope that you found this valuable. And again, you know, I would love to learn about how everybody does when they're done with their programs, because again, just meeting you all tonight, I know wherever you go, you're going to think of Pittsburgh maybe as you got your education there, but you're going to change your little corner of the world by helping others as much as you can. And I'm, I'm glad I was able to give some information to you today. Thank you so much, Holly. I know a lot of this was was new to me, so I very much appreciate it. There's a lot of, I don't know if you can see the chat, but um, there's oh, yeah. a, a lot of people expressing their appreciation oh. um, for your presentation tonight. I, so, so thank you, it was wonderful. Oh, you're welcome. And one last thing, if anyone um, has any interest, um, you know, if, if you have an hour, if you if you want to come stop by our department, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you, show you some devices, talk about our program. Uh, I know Shireen is very familiar with where I'm at and she could give you a, a, a good uh, direction. Great. Well, that's a great offer. Thank you. You're very welcome. And uh, stay tuned. Pittsburgh's on the map. We're going to do a lot of wonderful things. And uh, again, I'll be yeah. happy to help um, uh, Joanna. Uh, you know, I'll be happy to help you with your son. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, Thank you so much. I think we, I, everyone has your contact information and can reach out and, um, and um, we will stay in touch. All righty. Thank you, everybody. Okay. And good luck. Have and uh, luck. take care. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Holly. Oh, you're well. Oh, you're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.